Hello, BookTube. You're not going to believe this. I scarcely believe it myself, but I have more used books to show you. <laughs> I went out to do a couple of errands today. That's all. It was just supposed to be a couple of errands. Of course, I ended up with a bag full of books. These were from an old friend who runs a church here in Boston, and he has periodic, um, very informal charity sales. And, uh, he gets a ton of book donations, far more than he can use, even for his sales. And uh, he often lets me have my run of them before they the, the tables get set up. I've told him a thousand times that I don't have any need for books. <laughs> and, that I, and that even if I did, I could certainly, you know, come with the rest of the attendees and pay my $2 like, like anybody else. Uh, but he insists... He insists otherwise. He insists that uh, that he owes me uh, first crack at these books. <laughs> it's just crazy. And uh, I've told him. I've, we joke all the time. I've told him, well, well, you know, won't your God get angry? <laughs> and he said, he always tells me that, that when it comes to things that anger his God, I am strictly small potatoes. <laughs> so, so I filled a bag with books. Uh, and since they were all free, and since all I had to do was come back here with them, I didn't have to mail them anywhere or anything like that. I was, uh, I just grabbed whatever looked interesting to me uh, until I had filled my bag, until I had as much as I could carry. I wasn't going to add a tote bag or two tote bags. That would be greedy. <laughs> I left a ton of books behind. A ton of them. Far more than he could possibly sell at this sale. And I still found a bunch of good stuff, a bunch of interesting stuff. I wanted to show them to you. Uh, since I'm on a run, I guess, for used books. Uh, and the first one that I want to show you is mass market paperback. I'm not much of a fan of mass market paperbacks anymore. I used to read them all the time. They are, in fact, uh, one of a very small handful of perfect human inventions. where They cannot be improved in any way. And for what they do, they cannot be improved in any way. Like the wheel. Uh, but I saw this one, and it's in it's it's got to be thirty years old, but it's in perfect condition. It looks like the day it was printed, uh, and also it's a translation of of the work that I don't have. It's this right here. It's the old uh, what is this Bantam? Yeah, the Bantam Classic Mass Market Paperback of Anna Karenina. Look at that, it's still bright white, still not, not a single touch on it anywhere. When this, I don't think this edition will will tell me when it came out. Uh, but this, uh, yeah, it doesn't really tell me, but this, this this particular cover, I know I was selling 30 years ago. So this is an old book. I defy you, for instance, to find a Word document program that's equally old that works immediately, that works upon touch, without any kind of negotiation whatsoever. I can operate this, love it, enjoy it, uh, tear it to pieces, annotate it, the heck out of it. I can do all of that now, immediately, exactly the same as I could have 30 years ago. Uh, that's what I meant by perfect uh, invention. But this is this is a translation by Joel Carmichael. Uh, it has Malcolm Cowley's famous uh, Tolstoy essay at the beginning where he talks about genius and, and whatnot. It's a wonderful, wonderful essay. It's in, I have a collected Malcolm Cowley, and that, that essay is in there. It should be. Uh, because, you know, with, with reprinted classics like this, Somebody's got to get the brief to do the introduction. It's it's a joyless work. I have never been asked to do it. I wish that I were. Uh, but then again, if I were, I would probably join the chorus of literary friends that I've had over the years who have uh, been asked to do such things and hated it. <laughs> so maybe. But, but every once in a while, every once in a while, there will be an introduction to a volume like this that just jumps with lightning. And those are always fun. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure that I have, that I know the Carmichael translation all that well. And who knows when I'll ever see it again? Who knows when, it, what other format it will ever be in? Surely, if you're a major publishing house now and you're thinking about bringing out an edition of Anna Karenina, you will commission a translation of your own. You won't, you won't reprint <laughs> anything like that. And I think, I think Penguin has settled on some other, someone else's translation, both old and new, for this book. So. Uh, uh, I was I was happy to find it, even though it's a mass market. I'll, I'm sure I'll reinforce it a bit and then uh, just stick it in my bag. Uh, and then this next one, you got to feel sorry for the author of this next one because he doesn't even make it onto the cover of his own book. This is something I have not read. Uh, this is Starfleet Academy, 
the Delta Anomaly. And as you can see, this is not the real Star Starfleet. This is not the real Star Trek. This is the J.J. Abrams Star Trek. Uh, uh, we, you have you have uh, Chris Pine as a young Captain Kirk. You have Zoe Zlatna as a uh, as Uhura, and you have uh, Zachary Quinto as Spock on this. And the the Starfleet Academy series for the J.J. Abrams Star Trek universe will be one in which all of our main characters were at the Academy together. I have always preferred, of course, the real Star Trek, the Gene Roddenberry Star Trek. Uh, and in the Gene Roddenberry Star Trek, our characters don't all, haven't all known each other since they were five years old. That kind of removes the, the, the drama and also the complexity of them getting to know and respect and like each other if they've all known each other forever. Uh, and it also, in my opinion, undercuts the phenomenon of James T. Kirk, which is that he melds his crew into an incredible combination of work, team, and family. He wouldn't have needed to do that if they'd known each other forever. I, I much prefer it that they that the other way. But then again, there's virtually nothing about the J.J. Abrams version of the universe continuity of Star Trek that I prefer to the original. Uh, but this book is by Nick Barba, and you have to look in the small print of the front page to find his name. His name is not on the book, on the cover of the book. And it's the story of our, our heroes, let's see, uh, after a rough week at Starfleet Academy, James T. Kirk and his friends blow off steam at a San Francisco's hottest new club. Their good times come to a screeching halt, however, when one of the cadets is attacked by someone who seemingly appears out of thin air. Bones and his medical team save the cadet's life, but they uncover the horrifying consequences of the attack. Meanwhile, Starfleet's investigation reveals the assailant is actually a brutal serial killer from the past, a mysterious entity known only as the Doctor, with a capital D. <laughs> Some of you are Whovians. Your, your attention just pricked up, same as mine did. Uh, who is the Doctor, and why has he returned after disappearing for more than 20 years? At the urging of Commander Spock, Cadet Uhura is called in to help decipher a chilling message from the Doctor. Spock has no idea that by enlisting Uhura's help, he has placed her firmly in the Doctor's sights. I have never read this. I, I, I'm, I admit I am well behind on Abrams vs. Star Trek fiction of any kind. I don't know even how much there is. Uh, so, I, I mean, it's, it's, this is going to be 30 minutes. So, so I, I think I can spare 30 minutes even for fake Star Trek. Uh, then this next one is a Dover Thrift Edition. Do you, do a lot of you probably remember Dover Thrift Editions. I advise against them, usually. Especially modern Dover Thrift Editions. Some of them will be in your bookstores. And they're reliably less expensive than any other edition, except maybe, maybe Barnes & Noble thrift editions, Barnes & Noble editions of classics. I actually, I know, I know, I feel, I empathize completely with the heartache of going to new bookstores on a limited budget. Books are obscenely expensive. Far, far more expensive for you to buy than they are for publishers to produce. Uh, and that's because major publishers were taken over by business conglomerates like Bertelsmann that view these things as units. Why are the prices so low? Jack the prices up. <laughs> we need to maximize profit on these units. Uh, but that's a video for another time. Uh, and when you go to bookstores, new bookstores, you will, and you see, like, for instance, a Barnes & Noble classic edition of uh, some, some work of the canon, or a Dover Thrift edition, you'll be tempted. And I want, I know I'm in the wrong position. I know that I, that I am, he used the horrible 21st century word, privileged, when it comes to book supply, both used and new. But still, I want to urge you not to give in. Most of those editions are poor. Uh, the, the really excellent uh, Barnes Noble classics edition of a classic in those, in those cheap $5 paperbacks, for instance, the really excellent ones are few and far between. Their edition of Herodotus and Thucydides are both excellent. But most of them know, and even the good ones, the quality of the production is so poor. In both cases, Barnes & Noble, for instance, and Dover, I'm picking on those too, but I could, I could name a couple of others as well. The production values are so poor that it might look like you're saving money at the moment that you're at the cash register, but you're not, because you're not going to get more than one good read out of those books before they fall apart, before the, the cardboard cover pops off the spine of the pages, and then the thing is useless to you. So I, my, my advice is always, if you're like, for instance, if you're building a, a, a library of the Western canon and, for instance, you want 
the Count of Monte Cristo, and you go to your local Barnes and Noble and you see four different editions of the Count of Monte Cristo, my advice would be scrimp on a couple of cafe lattes, put off a couple of uh, CD purchases, wait, save, and buy a really good Count of Monte Cristo. I, the Modern Life, the Everyman Hardcover, or the Penguin Classic Big Trade Paperback, something like that, rather than just grab it because it's cheap, especially since a lot of these things are free on Project Gutenberg, so there's no bar to you reading them. You can read them by downloading them on your phone. So I, I always want to urge restraint that way. And yet, the next book that I want to show you is a Dover Thrift Edition, and the reason for that is because some of you will know this if you've been around books for a very long time. A long time ago, 30, 40 years ago, the Dover line of paperback reprints was actually excellent. Not only was the binding excellent, really good, these those old, older Dover editions do hold up, you can still read them, uh, but also their, their choice of material was just superb. The, the early American nature writings, travel writings in multiple volumes, and the, their reprints of classics of fiction and nonfiction, just superb. <laughs> and this is one of the good ones. This is Anthony Trollope, our very own Anthony Trollope. This is the Claverlings. And it has the Edwards illustrations all throughout. Uh, it's the original typeset from the original uh, book printing. See that? It's, it's, it's got that all throughout. And this thing is, well, let me see. Let me see if it tells me. Uh, 1977 is when this came out. And I get this all the time. I see this, this particular Dover edition of Trollope all the time. Uh, Dover did almost all of Trollope's great novels in these bigger trade paperbacks. And a lot of them, they just sprang for the original illustrations. So they are, in fact, volumes to have. He knew he was right, the way we live now. These are good volumes. This is a good volume. It has an excellent, very smart introduction uh, that was originally commissioned for Dover, I believe. Uh, and it has all of those illustrations. And it's a fantastic novel. Oh, my God. It's a fantastic novel. Pure English novel. A, a well-to-do country family, a beautiful house with a park, all sorts of intrigue, uh, fox hunting, of course, There's, there is a terrific fox hunting scene in here, even for Trollope. And also, there's an odious foreigner, <laughs> this is Mrs. Gordeloup, who you just, you'll want to kill her. By the time the book is over, you'll know, you know from early on in the novel that Trollope is going to give her her comeuppance, you know that's true. Uh, there are all sorts of other people in the book who are working you know, for and against the right and whatnot, but she is everything that Trollope hates. She's the kind of character that he makes specifically to destroy. <laughs> because she's not just working against what's good and right, she's also mean and petty. <laughs> she's little. Uh, and he hates such people. <laughs> and his, his hatred is so wonderful to read. Mrs. Gordeloup is... <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure that I've had this before. In fact, I might have shown it. I might have had editions like this before. I usually uh, send them out. I, I'll, I'll tell people, they'll say, you know, what's a good edition of X, Y, or Z Trollope? And I'll say, well, you know, there are all sorts of good editions. One you might think of if you see it at a used bookstore is the Dover, the old Dover, because it will have the illustrations. Excuse me. Uh, and the binding will be pretty good, so you'll be just fine. And those people invariably come back with, well, can you send it to me? <laughs> and then I do. <laughs> I wouldn't have gone to the bother of just immediately sending people books that I think they might like if all the rest of you hadn't been so generous with my Patreon. Yeah. <sighs> I do it anyway. And I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, this next one, another trade paperback. This is a crappy trade paperback. It's in, you know, uh, it's in good shape, but it's it's uh, an amateurish design. It's poor uh, cover binding glue. The, it's... Uh, rationing years paper quality. I, I got this because I saw it and realized, oh my god, I haven't read that in so long. And I got, this was free, so I got it not only to maybe dip a toe into rereading, even though it's going to fall apart, but at mainly uh, that thing you do sometimes with these books where you get one copy as a reminder to be on the lookout for a good copy. <laughs> I do that anyway. Probably no sane person does that. This is Osbert Sitwell. Uh, and this is uh, Noble Essences. What is this? Who does this? This is uh, Grosset's Universal Library. Like just, just 
<laughs> it's it won't survive. But this is it, it's really really good. It's it's uh, his uh, sort of his snarky tart epicene response to eminent Victorians, where he talks about some of the famous people that he's known: uh, Sickert the painter, uh, Edmund Goss, uh, Ronald Furbank, uh, a whole a whole bunch of other people. There's there's uh, there might be a table of contents in here. God, look at how, look at how crappy this is. Jeez, the pages are like they're like powder. Uh, Arnold Bennett, uh, Gabriel D'Annunzio, the the Italian novelist and weirdo. <laughs> uh, and I haven't I haven't read any of these profiles, if you want to call them that, in just forever. So so I grabbed this when I saw it. As a curiosity, I will I will read it until it falls apart. Uh, and then this next one, uh, is I think the only hardcover that I got, certainly the only one, you know, yeah, it's the only hardcover. It's the only thing with a dust jacket. I will reinforce the dust jacket because uh, I love the book. I've had it before uh, and gotten rid of it when people ask, do you, give me, like, for instance, the last copy that I had was years ago, I think five or six years ago. I think I wrote about it for my literary blog, my intergalactically famous literary blog, Steve Reads. I think I wrote uh, about it, because I think I remember, uh, from my old Steve Reads literary blog, I used to try to end every uh, entry with a picture of my old, dear, stupid, crazy, fat, gassy, basset out Lucy reading the book. And I think I remember, we used to argue, she, she and I used to argue all the time about those photos. Some days the, herself was in the mood, and other days she wasn't. And I think I remember arguing with her about that picture, saying, Baby, will you do this? I'd put it in front of her, and she would burp on it, or she would bite it. Uh, and if you if you ever had a Basset Hound, when they misbehave, they, they are so sure of themselves that th they misbehave in the same way they do everything else, which is very slowly. So... You're just watching them misbehave, and it's taking place over a long period of time. And uh, it melted my heart every time, so... <laughs> anyway, uh, it's this. It's Emily Kimbrough. It's Pleasure by the Busload, uh, which is a, her a travel writing of a trip to Portugal about 60 years ago, something like that. She, was, she shot fame uh, with her collaborator, on a, a book called When Our Hearts Were Young and Gay, which is gone now, unfortunately, uh, and which is pure delight, just pure delight, uh, and sold wheelbarrows full of copies. That When Our Hearts Were Young and Gay was a genuine hit of a book. Uh, and it floated both their careers, and uh, Emily Kimbrough just traveled all over the place and loved writing about it. She wrote a lot of books. So when I see them, uh, this is the only one I ever see. Pleasure by the Busload is the only one I ever see. It's delightful, absolutely delightful. It's got illustrations by uh, Marcio Vassilou. Uh, and it's, it's uh, let me see if I can show you an illustration. It's just full of just the sort of thing, just the sort of uh, light, airy, and really, really wonderful observations that filled when our hearts were young and gay. It's it's very much along those lines. You don't want to disappoint your customers, uh, and I I mean I have another copy now, so I will reinforce this one again. I will hold on to it as long as I can, and then invariably there will come a time when somebody will say to me, you know, on your recommendation, I just found and read a copy of when our hearts were young and gay, and I loved it. Is there more? Can can I have more? And there are. They wrote books together, but Emily Kimbrough also wrote, she's, she's just wonderful company all throughout her books. Uh, let me see, what do we have here for, uh, yes, okay, uh, for the most part, I am a devoted American, and I think I know my country rather well. Born in the Middle West, educated in the East, I have traveled the length and breadth of it every winter over the last many years on speaking tours. I make this round of the cream chicken circuit because of my love of the country and the people in it. I cherish the opportunity it gives me to meet, talk, and make friends with every section, and heaven knows our country is sectionalized. I do not love the American who comes abroad with ignorance and arrogance. Uh, but it isn't, it isn't like she takes it, it right after that paragraph she takes off the task of getting all serious it isn't a serious book but she does occasionally have moments like that and they're wonderful 
Uh, and then the next book, right along the lines of our ongoing project in 2019 here on this channel, of grappling with poetry, grappling with contemporary poetry. Uh, this is a book by one of my favorite contemporary poets. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Kenneth Coke. And this is, uh, can you see it on the light there? Making Your Own Days. This is the, the uh, pleasures of writing and reading poetry. Uh, and it ranged, as you can tell from the pictures on the cover, it ranges all over the place, all over the poetic landscape. He is, was a wonderful, wonderful teacher, a wonderful person, and a fantastic poet. Uh, and I remember this book. Uh, of course, it has a blurb from Dead Roar. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, thereby hangs a tale. <laughs> uh, 1998. This came out in 1998. I loved it. And uh, I don't own a copy. Now I do. I, I, I'm, it's the perfect thing because reading and considering contemporary poetry has me wondering about all kinds of books about contemporary poetry. I've read quite a few and really like them. I've mentioned Glenn Maxwell's book on poetry on this channel, which is incredible, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, this next one is also poetry. Uh, I don't understand why I had to find this at a thrift store, you know, at a, at a, a church jumble sale instead of getting it in the mail, unless I got it in the mail and uh, forgot about it <laughs> and got rid of it. I don't know one way or another. But this is the new Norton Critical Edition of Paradise Lost. Lovely thing. Nice, big, meaty thing uh, with uh, the poem and then a whole bunch of critical responses over centuries. Just wonderful. The Norton Critical Editions, you really can't go wrong. They are a great, great uh, blast of entertainment. If you don't know the classic that is the particular edition, you're going to know it really well by the time you're done, because the notes on it in the text are fantastic, and then you've got all those essays. So you can track how it was received originally, how its uh, fortunes ebbed and flowed, and the last few essays of every Norton Critical are always modern, so that you know what people are thinking about it, writing about it now. The editors usually do a fantastic job, so those supplementary essays are usually very varied in tone. <laughs> Sorry for the background noise. <laughs> my, my miniature schnauzer is attempting to burrow her way to freedom. <laughs> she's on the bed. I mean, she's not going to get anywhere. I don't know why she's doing <laughs> Usually, when she starts to burrow like crazy like that, it means that she is preparing for a deep nap. <laughs> so that's probably what's going to happen. But I, I don't. I have, as you know, if you've watched this channel, I have a bunch of Norton Critical Editions. I don't think I have this one, so I'm glad to have it. I'll uh, I'll put it with the Norton Critical Editions. But first, I think I'll read a few of the essays. That's that's always fun. Uh, this next one is Penguin Classic, uh, Sir Thomas Brown. The major works. I have a, a small mass market orange spined penguin classic of this same edition, which is incredible. Uh, and I, you know, I never look at that orange spined mass market anymore. In fact, I'm, I might have gotten rid of it, just hoping that I would find a trade paperback uh, that I can reinforce and just put on the shelf with the other penguins. Uh, and this is it's a, a bit coincidental because just yesterday I got an instance of the finger post, and here I'm getting a. a the writings of Sir Thomas Brown himself, uh, and that's kind of creepy in a way that coincidences always are. Uh, but nevertheless, this edition is fantastic. It has a terrific, readable introduction, very smart introduction, tons of great notes, where the the uh, editor here, C.A. Petrides, uh, doesn't just content himself with noting the, with annotating the book himself. He also mixes liberally um, not only uh, Brown's own annotations because he knew perfectly what well. he couldn't leave his own works alone, so he annotated them heavily. Uh, but then later, Coleridge loved this author and wrote tons of stuff about him. And uh, Petrides puts Coleridge all throughout the book. Instead of just quoting him a couple of times in the introduction, the way some people would, he runs his commentary all throughout the book, which is wonderful. Uh, and also, this has, if I remember correctly, this has uh, Samuel Johnson's biographical essay of Brown, which is great. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, and to have it in one book with all of Brown's writings, or a large part of Brown's writings, is wonderful. So, a, a perfectly fine Penguin Classic, I got that. And then, we'll finish up with this last one. This last one uh, was, it's a bit of a weird choice, a bit of a gamble. Uh, it's sort of a... It, throwing my, my my standard into the wind because uh, it's the third volume in a trilogy. And 
if the fates showed me a free copy of the third volume of this trilogy, I'm wondering if that means, I know this is all very mystical mumbo jumbo, but it, I only, I'm only this way with used books. I'm wondering if that means that the fates are going to put the other two volumes in my way sometime soon, also cheap or free. <laughs> and it's this, it shall be foot. His uh, three-volume history of the, of the American Civil War. This is volume three. Uh, I I like this. It, it, as you can see, it's going to take. I'm going to have to reinforce it just a bit, but it's it's remarkably solid uh, for something that I only had to walk away with. I didn't put down any money for it. Uh, but I I I have a bit of a guilty conscience about this particular trilogy. As you all know, I love Bruce Catton's trilogy on the American Civil War. I think that to show one of the greatest works of American history. And he, since Ken Burns' documentary, where Shelby Foote emerged as the spirit and, you know, the wise old man of the whole series, you're kind of sort of morally obligated to love this, his own series. And I, I do like it, but I've never liked it anywhere near as much as Bruce Catton. And I hate to think that that's a generational thing. So whenever I, uh, I spot these things, I always think, you know, maybe now is the time for a big reread. Just reread the whole trilogy. So maybe I'll do that. <laughs> maybe I'll do that in 2019. Maybe I will reread Shelby Foot in 2019 and see what I make of it. I'll just keep going back to this. I'm certainly going to reread Bruce Catton in 2019. So maybe maybe that's it. I don't I don't recall from the the catalogs and the long listings if that I don't recall that this is going to be a banner year for Civil War histories, popular Civil War histories, non monograph Civil War histories uh, from new from publishers new. There's one coming out next month that is a, a new take on the Civil War. I forget the name of it. Uh, no, I don't have it here. Uh, it looks really interesting. I haven't got to it yet, and I don't think we've received it uh, 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 in the mail on this channel. But I will, I will, uh, if I remember correctly, I will find it and jot it down in, in what Sean, the book maniac, refers to as the show notes. Uh, and you, we can keep an eye out for it together. But but in terms of, like, for instance, big biographies of Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson or, you know, uh, Ulysses S. Grant had his memoirs, but a great annotated edition of his memoirs, but really not much. There's not certainly not in terms of the war. Maybe biographies of major players, like, for instance, <laughs> uh, there's an ongoing multi-volume uh, biography of Abraham Lincoln by Sidney Blumenthal, uh, an old-fashioned throwback to the era when, when gentlemen scholars wrote multi-volume biographies of the characters who interested them. Nobody does that anymore. And he is doing that with Abraham Lincoln, and his next volume comes out this year, and the volumes are getting better as they go along. They are, it is, they are growing in cumulative power as they go along. So, and that comes out, I think, in the spring. Sidney Blumenthal's next book on Abraham Lincoln. But still, large panoramic histories, military histories of, world, of the, the American Civil War, not so much. Uh, so it, maybe I'll fill that gap. I'll, maybe I'll, I am going to read Bruce Catton because I found, I found his centennial history of the American Civil War when I was up in tiny town Vermont <laughs> uh, for dirt cheap, the hardcovers for dirt cheap. Uh, so I am going to reread that. And maybe the other great Civil War trilogy. I should read them, you know, at the same time and see what I make of that. That might be fascinating on its own, but one way or another. Now I have Volume 3, and we'll see if Volume 2 and Volume 1 crop up in my path. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I'm, that's it. That's it for for now. That was a yet another used book haul of just fascinating bits and ends and odds and stuff like that. I wasn't expecting it at all, but I had a bag, and it wasn't that freezing cold today. It wasn't snowing. And so I indulge myself. <laughs> so uh, I will I will wrap this up for now. We have plenty of other bookish stuff to talk about, though. So I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.